Um, so for those that, that, that don't know the specifics of my diagnosis, I'll just share it with you briefly because I think it's helpful to frame the discussion around uh, the journey that Whitney and I have been on together for a year. Um, so I have a, a type of brain cancer that's called glioblastoma multiform. Uh, this is a, a, a grade four brain cancer. Um, grading is often confused with staging. Uh, I confuse grading with staging. Um, but there are uh, astrocytomas, are a type of brain cancer. They come in many grades. Uh, when you get the baddest, worst, meanest kind, that's a grade four astrocytoma, which also goes by the name glioblastoma. Uh, there are 700,000 Americans living with a primary uh, brain tumor. Um, so that's a lot of folks. Uh, I'm among that group. Uh, there are 79,000 more folks that are diagnosed every year in the United States with a primary brain tumor. Um, so, uh, uh, putting that in, in perspective, Whitney and I were in Washington, D.C. recently having congressional meetings. Uh, Whitney pulled some numbers to help make a compelling story with some of our elected officials. Uh, and of course, representing the Hoosier state to Hoosier elected officials, we said, well, let's put it in, in these terms. So Whitney gets the credit for this. The 79,000 is, you know, roughly how many people fit inside Lucas Oil Stadium. So if you think about all the people that come out for a, a Colts and Patriots game, uh, maybe not this previous season, but think, you know, <laughs> a good season. Uh, you fill up that whole place, you sell it out. Uh, that's the number of people that will be diagnosed uh, with a primary brain tumor in the United States this year. Um, so that's a big, it's a big number. Um, unfortunately, um, there are 1.6 million cancer diagnoses in the United States every year. Uh, so 79,000 sounds big, uh, but of course 1.6 million is a larger number. Um, so cancer uh, will soon surpass heart disease as the leading cause of death in the United States. Um, so I think this is helpful to frame our discussion um, because I'm one face with you this evening, uh, but one face that represents however you want to slice it, 700,000 people with a primary brain tumor, uh, 79,000 newly diagnosed folks, uh, 1.6 million cancer diagnoses. Well, here is Adam, and I'm a face, and my primary caregiver, Whitney, uh, there's another face for you. So I think it's helpful to think about those big picture statistics and then to narrow them down. Uh, over the past maybe week and a half, um, I've, I've met some new people, and some of that comes on the heels of uh, the Indianapolis Star did a nice article uh, on, on my family, um, and that, that ran in today's paper, which was kind of a cool thing. I think the journalists did a wonderful job representing our family with integrity uh, and sort of true to the discussion that we had uh, when she spent some time with us. So there's been a little bit more press, I've been a little bit more active on social media, uh, and I met a new friend, her name is Alex, Alex is with us this evening, and she's going to wave, and I asked Alex if it was okay if I point her out, and she's waving, so Alex is one of those newly diagnosed uh, brain tumor folks, uh, so uh, it is wonderful that you're here, and thanks for, for figuring it out to be here. Um, there is so much power in community through sort of these online social media networks. So it's great to be together in a room, uh, but it's great to be together virtually as well. Um, you know, uh, yeah, sure, this is a, a rare brain cancer that I have. So the community that I have forged has been a community online. Um, so we oftentimes uh, speak dismissively to things like Facebook or to Twitter, uh, but there is so much value. When you uh, don't have transportation, or you're not allowed to drive, uh, or you can't even get out of bed, uh, if you can get out your phone and get on Twitter and connect with people around the country and around the world who have your same diagnosis, uh, that's a really powerful connection. Uh, so I met Alex um, online just, you know, I don't know, in the past week and a half or so, and already she's active in one of the groups on Facebook that I'm active on. So at any rate, um, I wanted to, it's so cool that she's here because this is sort of like rare diagnoses and here she is and I'm here and we got a couple of us and that's awesome. And look at us, we're doing well. Alex is, is hey. <laughs> I just passed the one year stable mark. Uh, if you're here in March, you know that the, by the big population statistics, uh, only 37% of us are supposed to make it the first year. Uh, well, obviously those statistics are flawed because I'm doing awesome. Uh, so that's great. So I love philosophy. And many of my close friends know that about me and that I even would venture to say that I'm a little bit of a philosopher myself. Uh, it's something that I've aspired to be for really a long time. There are probably some, some distinguishing uh, characteristics of what makes a professional philosopher versus what makes sort of an interested 
lay philosopher or a folk philosopher. I think these distinctions uh, come down to something like um, growing up, my dad and I used to shoot hoops out in the driveway. Uh, we were playing basketball, uh, but LeBron wasn't there. So that doesn't discredit the game that we were playing, uh, but we weren't playing at a professional level. Um, so there is such a thing as professional philosophy, and then there's such a thing as sort of philosophy uh, for all of us. And what that might look like in your life is something like, I think that the best leadership philosophy is servant leadership. So professional philosophers may or may not engage with you on that discussion, uh, but for the rest of us, it's nice to have those conversations. But those conversations emerge from sort of the foundation that is laid by professional philosophers. I've had uh, really a privilege and an honor uh, to learn from some really excellent professional philosophers. Uh, and I, I'll, you know, I'll sort of, so John Tilley, uh, Dr. Professor John Tilley, uh, Dr. Professor Tim Lyons are two of those. There, nobody else like it. I don't want to leave anybody out. So a couple of the professional philosophers uh, that I've just had the great privilege and honor to study under or to learn from uh, or to uh, you know, cram handouts before exams uh, with. And somebody else who has a connection to those same people and also has a deep passion for philosophy is a friend of mine named Jack. And Jack is, is back there uh, and came with his family this evening. And I bring this uh, to your attention this evening because Jack has started in motion something that is very touching to me and to my family. And Jack has started in motion a fundraising to establish a philosophy scholarship at IUPUI that will be in my name. It will be the Adam Hayden Philosophy Scholarship. I'm not sure if we're settled on that name. I don't know if there's a ring to that name. We probably need something a little jazzier. But that is it. So there is, um, so there is, a, there is a lesson that's really easy to sort of just uh, uh, sort of extract from this experience, and it's this: it's just be kind. It's really, really important to be kind, uh, because I don't know if Jack and I really would have met if we hadn't both been sort of kind people that are open-minded to conversation with other kind people. Um, so while I was going uh, to, to school to, my, to finish my undergrad and then for grad school. Uh, I was a bartender at a bar downtown called The Libertine. Uh, and Jack liked to come there, uh, and I served Jack a couple drinks, not too many. <laughs> Everything was respectful. And, uh, Jack and I connected over philosophy. So he also uh, went to grad school at IUPUI. We know very many of the same people, have had common experiences. That's something that connected Jack and I. Whitney and I had the opportunity uh, to have, have dinner with Jack and, and Kylie, who, his wife, who's, who's with him, and then that's Pax too. I'm sorry to call you out. You can wave. It's a small group, so I don't I think it's all right. Um, and Jack shared the news with me that he has been thinking about uh, how to do something that would be kind of a, a, a legacy for me, and that is a beautiful, beautiful legacy. So this is, this is sort of off topic of the talk. But this is a great opportunity to share that information with everybody. You'll see if you are following me on social media that uh, events will start being shared. Uh, Stella is a restaurant on Mass Ave. They're hosting a dinner in July, July 23rd. Uh, you can purchase tickets. The money will go to fund the Adam Hayden Philosophy Scholarship, uh, TBD, flashy name. Um, so Will, uh, there are some great, uh, my time in the service industry, uh, I tried to really be kind. So uh, chefs that I worked for, um, they hear that something's going on with Adam, and they think, well, that dude was pretty cool, so we'll do something for him. And so we're starting to line up some folks who are going to host uh, dinners and events and things like this to raise money for the Adam Hayden Scholarship. So this is a, you're, you're sort of a, here's a nice core group of folks that came in March and you're here again. So this is just kind of by way of preliminary stuff to let you know. As I share those events, uh, I certainly hope that you'll make it a priority uh, to come to those events uh, because that is to uh, certainly to perpetuate the legacy and my love of philosophy and Jack's love of philosophy, um, but it's also to benefit uh, future students, future scholars um, who are going to sort of see their way through a degree to become a professional philosopher so they can lay the groundwork for us folk to have a conversation about servant leadership or something down the line. All right, so I want to talk some about that. 
So I think what I love about philosophy is this, that philosophy prizes, uh, sort of above all else, just a love of inquiry. Uh, Professor Lyons, who's here, uh, taught me that, I think, in the very first course that I took with him, um, which is really what we ought to be doing uh, in all avenues of research, whether that's uh, a bench researcher who's looking in a microscope uh, and watching cells divide, or if that's somebody who's um, examining theory change over time and wondering what about that old theory showed up in that new theory. What we're all doing is engaging ourselves in the love of inquiry. And that's what attracted me to philosophy. And many people have said to Whitney and I both, that yes, you guys are strong, and uh, that you're, you're displaying such inspiration uh, through this very, very difficult process. I'll tell you, I am only doing that because I have a real love of inquiry. Philosophy taught me to formulate interesting questions about phenomena in the natural world. And I have an interesting question, how did this baseball grow in my head? Um, how do we detect those things using neuroimaging? How do we help to map the brain so we can remove some of the skull and go in and get that thing? Those are super interesting questions. When they're happening, happening to you, they're terrifying. But if you've been trained to love inquiry and to formulate questions, uh, then you are well positioned uh, to be uh, as strong as Whitney and I have been because I've sort of uh, treated myself as my own case study. Um, so thank you to philosophy for putting me in a position to sort of handle bad news, but to do it with interest and curiosity and excitement about what I have to learn. So tonight's sort of subtitle, I called the first one Inside My Head and then yada, yada, yada. And tonight I was like, Inside My Head, I think that's catchy. Uh, but tonight was called Toward Recovery. So I figured that I should talk to you some about recovery because that would make it a true chapter two. Um, that we got up to surgery last time, so now we need to speak a little bit about what came next. So the tone was set in these ways. So I recovered in the neurocritical care unit, and I had a really wonderful uh, nurse uh, my, my couple of days after my brain surgery, who really um, was just a source of comfort for me, and encouraged me right away, uh, this nurse did, uh, to start <coughs> recording and documenting and thinking about my thoughts, and in fact, uh, uh, he came up with the inside my head thing. He's like, hey, Adam, you should write a book and you should call it Inside My Head. Um, I've done some research and there are like a bunch of blogs and stuff called Inside My Head. I mean, it's not super original, right? So um, I, I probably would get sued if I really tried to publish under that, but I mean, it's catchy enough and clever for this. But he got me thinking about this maybe really could be something. So that gave me motivation immediately um, to not just take this as a, man, why me? But to treat it as there's something that others can learn through this process. So in recovery, I started thinking. I had my journal. I had my iPhone uh, when Whitney allowed me to have it. She limited screen time, much as we do with our toddlers. It's over with the phone back. Uh, but in the time that Whitney allowed me to have my phone, I sent an email to another professor who's here this evening, uh, and that's Professor Emily Beckman. Uh, so I took a course in the medical humanities. Uh, so Professor Beckman holds a, a faculty position in the IU School of Liberal Arts and also in the IU School of Medicine. Um, so that's pretty flashy uh, to hold positions in both of those respected schools. So I took a course in medical humanities. And uh, one of the lectures that Professor Beckman gave was that, you know, it used to be the case that when you went to see a doctor, that doctor would maybe check your pulse. And the doctor would do so like one of these, right? Or I mean, I don't know one of these. I'm not, I'm, I've not been to medical school. Um, and then along came the stethoscope. And then your pulse uh, would be checked by an instrument placed on your chest or on your back. And so perhaps more information is available to you. Perhaps more consistent data collection is available now. But you've introduced something else to the process. You've put a physical barrier between the patient and the physician. 
Now, I don't suggest that we ought to be anti-technology. Uh, certainly, it was all of our medical advances that allowed neurosurgeons to skillfully remove, uh, you know, this big thing in my head, and then allow me to not be permanently paralyzed on the left side of my body. So medical advances and technology enabled that to happen. But if you were here in March and if you've heard me tell my story, you know the signature, distinct, most important, most significant event of my brain surgery, and I mean, we're talking like screws in your head brain surgery, a crazy thing to experience. The most significant memory from that experience is when my neurosurgeon reached down and placed his hand on my shoulder. How important touch is in medical care. So when I was reflecting on that experience, I immediately brought to mind that lecture. And so, in bed, with my head wrapped, and an, and an ice pack, and IV pain drugs, I got out my iPhone, and I composed a message, and in the subject line of that message read, a unique personal experience, which I mean, you know, that's right, isn't it? <laughs> unique and personal. It was an experience. And, I, and it, was, it was to Professor Beckman. I said, hey, uh, hi, we haven't spoken in a couple of years, but here's some crazy thing that just happened. Uh, and I think I want to do something with it. And I, it was probably vague and undefined when I sent that email, um, which maybe is cringeworthy now, because I feel like I want to take myself seriously as an academic. <laughs> I'm communicating with a professor and a doctor. Um, but at any rate, I sent this email and I was like, hey, could you give me a few minutes of class time down the road to share this experience? And she said, yeah, sounds cool. Let's do that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, I had to like sort of figure out uh, how to walk again or at least how to roll myself around in a wheelchair again before I could start doing that. So we sort of called a timeout and there was sort of shared interest there. And then that sort of got put on the back burner after laying that initial groundwork. My neurosurgeon came to visit me a couple of days after surgery. And my, my left arm was really pretty much paralyzed at that time. So uh, surgery on the brain is brain damaging. So you think about like people having brain damage, maybe in a terrible car accident or some other tragic accident or event. Um, but surgery on the brain is brain damaged. So I, you know, I'm brain damaged. That's a nice excuse. Uh, Whitney's like, I told you to change the clothes and to wash in the dryer. <laughs> Got brain damage. <laughs> Can't be trusted. Um, so I was complaining to my neurosurgeon who came to see me and said, hey, how's, how are how you feeling, right? And I said, well, uh, I had to pick up at that time my, my right arm, my good arm. I had to pick up my left arm and sort of move it around. And that's frightening. So uh, I was complaining about that to my neurosurgeon, which now also seems sort of trivial and petty in retrospect, that this person who just, you know, whatever, you get it. And I'm like, hey, buddy, I wish you would have done this. Like, I have any idea. My neurosurgeon said to me, Adam, can you move your arm at all? And I just had a little bit of ability to wiggle those fingers. I said, sure, and I, I wiggled those fingers. And he said to me, well, if you can move it a little bit, then we can get it better. And that was, and that, that, like, that was a discussion. And I thought at the time, well, you kind of give me more than that. Like, that seemed, just throw me a bone here. Um, but what I realized is that really set the tone for everything that would come after that, is that if you've got a little bit, just a, a step in the right direction, you can build so much more on that that if you can move it just a bit, well, sure, then we can get it better. And that started my steps towards recovery. And that conversation, I'm not sure if my neurosurgeon knows how impactful that conversation was. So that was in late May of 2016. In October of 2016, so this is four months after this unique personal experience. Um, I used a broadcast medium known as Facebook Live. I was in my parents' bedroom uh, because um, we moved in with my folks. Uh, and thank you for letting us move in with you. 
because um, we didn't really have anywhere else to go. Uh, so it's, that's nice. Um, it was wonderful to be accepted to a place that felt familiar, and we felt at home, and we felt embraced. Um, and it felt as though, regardless of what happens, we're in an environment that is safe, and we're protected, and our boys are cared for. So I went to Facebook Live from my parents' bedroom that we had kicked them out of so that Whitney and I could be in there with our baby. So it wasn't that glorious. <laughs> and I said, hey, I started a blog, and it's called Glioblastology. Uh, and I'm out here, and I'm trying to get some stuff done. Uh, so please follow along. And so that was in October, and... Uh, I was, I was trying to sort of crank out some blog pieces and trying to find my way. What do people care about? And it turns out they don't really care about the, the medical specifics of what you're sharing. They're really what people care about is narrative. So I started having conversations with friends that would come over and visit with me. I started thinking about how do I share my story with them in a way that is compelling, that teaches them something about the experience, but I get something out of it in return. Um, so uh, this is, because see, this is awesome. When I did this in March, there were so many people that I didn't want to call anybody out. But now it's like, oh man, I can see everybody. I'm going to call you out. So uh, Jim, who is, where is Jim? Wait, because I just saw you. Jim Eichelman. Yeah, there he is. Hi, Jim. I'm sorry that I, I had you and then I lost you. <laughs> so Jim uh, took me to radiation therapy, which is a daily thing. And it was at 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. Uh, there's been daylight savings time since then. Um, so, you know, somebody five days a week has to drive you to the hospital. Um, and I couldn't drive because of the seizure risk. So Jim and I had some great conversations in the car as he provided transportation to me to get up to radiation therapy, an opportunity to sort of ask some interesting and important and significant questions and to sort of talk about my experiences and what was going on. And so what I learned through this process uh, of storytelling is what I would later uh, learn to be called narrative medicine. Uh, and I only learned that by way uh, of Professor Beckman, uh, who, by medical humanities, there's this cool thing called narrative medicine. So narrative medicine, medicine seeks to teach doctors narrative skills. And I, I'm, I'm going to read this a little bit as a, as a quote. Uh, and it's from Rita Sharon, who is the director of narrative medicine at Columbia University, who is actually coming here for a conference later in June at IUPUI. And... I submitted a proposal uh, at Professor Beckman's encouragement, and it was accepted, and I get to present my story uh, at that conference, and I'm in the ses session right after uh, Dr. Sharon's sort of opening keynote address, which is awesome. So I'm super humble uh, and extremely nervous. <laughs> um, but here's what, here's what Dr. Sharon says is that what we're doing through the practice of narrative medicine is that we're establishing therapeutic partnerships. So those drives in the car with Jim, we were establishing a therapeutic partnership. So I don't know if you want to, it's cool. You can put that on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh, establishing therapeutic <laughs> partnerships. Yeah, it, LinkedIn was at the, get endorsed for that. <laughs> so that the idea is that by teaching these narrative skills, that you're teaching physicians to recognize, to absorb, and to interpret the accounts offered by patients, but expressly so that you may be moved to action. So that it isn't merely narrative, it isn't merely a storytelling event, but it's a storytelling event with the purpose of close listening and being moved to action. So I was moved to action by continuing to keep up this work uh, all the way back to October, uh, here we are today, and I've given a handful of these to a handful of different audiences, some to young doctors getting ready to embark on residency, who had an opportunity uh, to have sort of a real live brain cancer patient in front of them, and ask me tough questions, and me tell them about, hey, soon to be doctors, here's what you ought to be doing uh, when you get there. Uh, I can't think of sort of, that's cool, right? That I've been given a platform uh, through this diagnosis, uh, which I am very sort of in awe of the power of disease to give me a platform to share an uplifting story is a really, really cool thing. And I think it goes back to my love of philosophy, inquiry, formulating questions, 
being curious about the world. So there is a burden of responsibility on our doctors that they can recognize the narratives that are offered by patients. That patients <coughs> report their symptoms, but they're doing more than that. They're also sort of crafting stories about themselves. And through the process of sharing those stories, they're finding out what is really important to the patient. And the doctor, if taught narrative skills, is going to sort of clue into those things and say, here's what is most important to this person uh, who has this illness to which I am supposed to be treating in this circumstance. So there is a doctor uh, named Lucy Kalanithi. Lucy Kalanithi is, is, is the wife uh, of, the, of the now deceased chief resident neurosurgeon, Paul Kalanithi. Paul Kalanithi wrote a book, a memoir of his experience being diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, his battle to get back into the neurosurgical operating room, his battle fighting stage four lung cancer, his decision with his wife, Lucy, to have a child in the late stages of Paul Kalanithi's life, to make the decision to have a child knowing that death was knocking at the door. Paul Kalanithi completed his book, but it was, God, it was Lucy who saw that it was published. This is emotional to me because I write a lot, and so Whitney knows the, the passwords to the blog to pull up the draft posts. So Paul wrote this beautiful When Breath Becomes Air memoir that you should all pull out your Amazon apps and order right now. It is that good. Regardless of sort of where you are in your life, you should read the book. So Lucy Kalanithi writes the epilogue to that book and publishes it posthumously to, to Paul. And what Lucy Kalanithi says in a TED Talk is that what she and Paul were doing is seeking to understand the experience of illness, not only the technicalities. So what the doctor is doing the doctor comes from a foundation of understanding the technicalities of illness. And the doctor must be taught empathy. The doctor must be taught narrative skills in order to put the doctor in the position of the patient. So that the doctor may better understand the experience of illness, not only the technicalities. So Lucy talks about that process that she went through with Paul uh, in her TED Talk, which is about 18 minutes long, and you can Google it and look it up. And um, Lucy has interacted with me on Twitter, and I was like total fanboy about it, <laughs> which is really nerdy. Uh, but I think it's cool. So maybe I'll, we're recording this. Maybe I'll put up the link and I'll tag her. At Rocket Girl MD. That's Lucy Kalanithi's Twitter handle. If you're on Twitter, you can check her out. It's a public space. I'm not sharing any. It's not a violation of her privacy. So Lucy says she and Paul, they're seeking to understand the experience of illness, not only the technicalities, so the doctor that knows the technicalities must be taught the experience. What do we have as patients? We intimately know the experience of illness. I've taken 10 chemo cycles. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a chemo drug that is a great grandchild of mustard gas. So a, a chemical toxic agent that is sort of outlawed by the conventions of war turns into a chemotherapy drug that I swallow into my body and I'm supposed to wear gloves when I handle it. Isn't that wild? I know that routine really well. I know that the first couple of days I'll feel pretty good. Uh, but I know I'll wake up every morning with kind of a pit in my stomach. I know what other medicine to take to counteract some of the side effects. Uh, I know that there is a cumulative effect of timozolomide or timidar uh, made by Merck. Uh, I know that by the end of the week, I'm going to feel not great, which is why Whitney told you that Adam has not been having a great day uh, because we're at the, the tail end of, of this month's cycle. I know that experience. I know what it's like to go to radiation every day. I know what it's like to be stuck in a wheelchair, to not have the capacity to walk, and then to celebrate when you can make it to a walker, and then to celebrate again when you've graduated to a cane. 
So I know the experience of illness. I have an opportunity to share that with doctors who know only the technicalities. But the responsibility is not only on the doctors to understand the experience. I feel strongly that I bear a responsibility to teach myself the technicalities of the disease. That to only be in a, be in a, uh, a space of the experience does not give me informed consent when I agree to treatment. It also does not give me a foundation to decline treatment when I don't think it's right for me. <clears throat> that I bear a responsibility as a patient to live in my experience, but to seek to educate myself on the technicalities of my disease as well. I have a bookshelf uh, that my dad got me for Christmas uh, that is, uh, let's see, um, it, it's, uh, it's neuropharmacology, but there's a, there's, it may, it's fa fancier. I just call it my neuropharmacology textbook. Shoot, that's what it is. It's got a fancy name now. It's on neuropharmacology. What should I be doing with a neuropharmacology book? I have no idea. Uh, but it gives me an opportunity to study my disease and to learn the technicalities intimately. So if we are going to expect our doctors to put themselves in the shoes of the patient, then the patient needs to expect for him or herself uh, to put him or herself in the shoes of the doctor. I think that that is a give-and-take relationship. And I think that by crafting our narratives in such a way that we communicate this robust experience to our medical team, that our medical team should be expected to explain to us our disease in a way that we understand. So I said that I talk a little bit about balancing quality of life with treatment, and the way that I can bring that to life for you is by talking to you about my experience uh, with a, a medical device called Optune. So Optune is a cap that you wear on your head, uh, and it is approved uh, for glioblastoma, and it's in trial for some other types of solid tumors as well. Uh, the Optune device uh, with medical adhesive and a shaved head puts electrodes on your head that emit an alternating electric field. Tell me if I get too heady, I don't mean to be. Uh, that electrical field that is like zapping this way and zapping this way all the time, it disrupts cell division. So you've got a tumor somewhere in your body and tumors are after you because they want to spread. They want to take over the healthy tissue, and then they want to go plant themselves in other parts of the body. Uh, brain tumors tend to just stick to the brain. So in order for the tumor to grow, cells have to divide. Cellular division is a process known as mitosis. There will be a quiz. <laughs> so when a cell wants to divide, it's got a little nucleus in the middle of it that has some information, uh, some genetic information uh, that's stored in the DNA. Well, if you want to copy yourself, well, you've got to copy sort of all parts of you. So that DNA, we sort of casually refer to as kind of an instruction manual. So in fact, if you take a cell, uh, you know, out of one of my vital organs and you take a cell, uh, you know, out of my head and from my feet, the same genetic code is in each of those cells. So it's not a different cell type that are in different parts of your body, but in fact those cells differentiate in different ways because they talk to their cellular neighbors, which is interesting. I only think that's interesting because people think that's interesting. I'm looking to my philosophers, like they can back me up here, come yeah, it's interesting. So that process of division, it copies itself, so you got two of these little nucleus looking things, and then you've got, I need visual, like, now we'll do my tap dance. You've got two of these little nucleus guys, and then proteins line up like chain link, you know, when you used to do those construction paper chain link, you know, and hung it around the Christmas tree or something. They line up these proteins in just such a way, and they rely on their magnetic poles to line up. And then they each grab on to one of those nucleuses, and then they pull it apart. And then a cell that's kind of like one of these blobs then gets kind of pinched in the middle and pulls apart, and voila, mitosis, you've got two cells. So these electric fields going this way and that mess up the way that those proteins align so cells can't divide. So that's the, the basis behind the tumor-treating fields. I mean, I'm not trained in this at all, so... <laughs> you should probably consult the literature for a more thorough explanation. So you wear this thing, 
And the minimum is 18 hours a day. Like, you gotta be all in. And you gotta change these things every couple of days. And to change them, you know, you sort of peel them off. And oftentimes they cause skin irritation. They can sometimes burn you. Um, so there's a kind of a topical steroid that you can put on between changes and allow that to go to work a little bit. You scrub your head really good. You shave it again. You put the thing back on. Uh, you can, you got a battery backpack that you wear around. And so, Caregiver Whitney is responsible for changing these things every couple of days. Um, so hair growth messes up the electrodes. And if you see my beard, uh, I was in trouble a lot, so we had to change them frequently. So that was the Optune device. Sometimes I would rock our youngest son, Gideon, to sleep. And then I would go to lay him down in his crib. And then the, the three pound battery would sort of swing around and bang on the crib and the baby would wake up. So you're like, dude, it's only a three pound backpack, certainly you can handle it. Well, you let your one year old wake up. You tell me. So I don't know, big price to pay, small price to pay, I'm not so sure. I think it's how you define quality of life. So I determined that that was not consistent with my quality of life. I discontinued that therapy. But I didn't do it sort of just out of hand. I'm not doing this anymore. But in fact, I pulled papers from the phase three clinical trial and I dug into the data. Because that's my responsibility as a patient to be informed about the treatment uh, that I accept and the treatment that I decline. That just like the doctor should put themselves in the experience of the patient, the patient needs to be well informed about their treatments. That's a big message that I talk about all the time because I think it's really, really, really important. So your quality of life, balancing that with your treatment, depends on what is important to you, depends on what your value system is. My value system was such that I wanted to be able to rock my youngest child to sleep and to transfer effortlessly and to feel like I helped Whitney that while she's managing the other two Hayden hooligans, that's what their preschool teacher calls them, <laughs> that while she's trying to wrestle them to bed, that I can take responsibility for laying our baby to bed. That was consistent with my values and my quality of life. How do we learn about our values? By telling our story, by seeing what sticks out uh, when we talk about, when we craft our narrative. When we speak about what's most important, it is narrative skills. It is the intersection of clinical practice and literature and history and philosophy and ethics and about what is most important to us in our life. That is the trend and the direction of healthcare internationally as well as here in America. That is the direction that we're trending towards and it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, so if you just Google medical conferences and you're like, and who's gonna, you're not going to do this, I know. It's okay. You don't have to. But what you'll see is that more and more there are patient panels that are sessions that are part of these medical conferences. So the uh, American Society for Clinical Oncologists, the ASCO conference, uh, 2017, just happened on the Twitter hashtag, hashtag ASCO17. And several of us brain cancer people were getting into some deep conversations with some of those clinical oncologists over Twitter about, hey, what session are you having? A hospital administrator, well-intentioned hospital administrator, who does not deserve to be sort of shamed in the way that he was shamed and it was inappropriate, but just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, this hospital administrator said, hey, I've got a new plan for our board meetings. We're gonna have a red chair in the room and whoever sits in the red chair during that meeting has to think like a patient. Well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> got a bunch of patients out here. We're not red chairs, we're people. So that dude just got blown up on Twitter and I feel bad for him because he's a CEO and it's kind of embarrassing. I think some people in positions of power maybe should run their tweets by their PR team. <laughs> That's all I said. That's all I said. All right. The 
got a, I've got a, that was my Oculus story. There's some stuff in here about, about the rehab journey. And that's exactly what, what we're here to talk about. So I was at a Community North Rehab Facility. And so Whitney, uh, who is an occupational therapist who's worked in an inpatient setting for 10 years, uh, doing terrific work at Wishard and now at Eskenazi, she timed it really well. She was on maternity leave when they moved from Wishard to Eskenazi. So her coworkers were complaining about having to move. And she just like left and then came back. I got a new desk and a new building. So Whitney is an occupational therapist. She has a network of connections in the therapy community. And Whitney got on the phone and said, where can I find the best neuro-focused therapy team to rehab Adam as quickly as possible? And everybody said, Community North is the place where you have to go to do that. I was on the brain trauma unit. This is a locked unit. If you've gone to visit a friend in the hospital, you can go to the information desk and you can say, I'm here to see Adam Hayden. Can you please tell me what room he's in? And they'll say, sure, he's in room, you know, 51X, whatever. And you sort of ride the elevator up and you go and you see your friend. So on a locked unit, you have patients who are flight risks, who because of cognitive deficit or other related things, might try to leave uh, against their own well-being. So you had to get buzzed in onto my floor you had to get buzzed out when you were done visiting with me. You were immersed in an environment of people with significant cognitive deficits. Uh, so uh, Professor Tilly and Professor Lyons spent a lot of time with me in that environment. Thank you. I needed friends then, and you were friends to me. I'm going to cry. Um, the very first night I got there, uh, it was dinner time. Uh, and um, eating dinner with folks who are suffering from extreme brain trauma, cognitive deficits, this is a very difficult environment. Especially for me, who was fortunate, I told my neurosurgeon, if you've got to put me in a wheelchair, just don't <laughs> take away my language. And luckily, I mean, you know, you got different parts to do different things up here. And so it was motor sensory for me and not language and cognitive processing. I was in an environment where people had brain trauma, who were truly brain damaged. It was psychologically taxing. We think about quality of life and treatment. My parents came to visit me one night and I was having a terrible time. And we had a conversation about, is it time just to discharge? Just get out of here. I'm not, I, you know, I wasn't under arrest. But that was the hardest therapy work that I did. Every day of intense occupational therapy and physical therapy in a psychologically taxing environment. Weighing quality of life and treatment. My quality of life is contingent upon spending time with my kids, playing with my kids. That's what I value most. So I stuck it out in the brain trauma unit because I knew the therapy that I was getting was incredible. I have the journal from that period, and it reads, journal entries, therapy schedule. More to say, therapy schedule. And as I return to that journal, in preparation for this discussion this evening, there's just a beautiful tapestry of me repairing myself physically and me repairing myself emotionally. <laughs> So when we think about quality of life, and we think about balancing that with treatment, Optune didn't make sense in my life. Dealing with the psychological trauma of a brain trauma unit, but knowing that I was getting better physically every day was worth it. Those were decisions that I did not make alone, but I made within my community, a community of relationships, of friends, of loved ones, a community that supported me in reading literature and speaking with them about sort of these journal articles that I hold that I was nowhere near qualified to understand. 
but that I was trying to piece together in my own mind to make the best decisions for myself and for my family. And sometimes I stuck with it, and sometimes I gave it up, sometimes I accepted treatment, sometimes I declined treatment. But the responsibility there is not only mine, and it's not only my medical team, but it's about developing therapeutic partnerships. It is about seeing yourself at the table with your medical team. You are not there to passively receive treatment from your doctors, but you're there to engage in robust dialogue about what is most consistent with your quality of life, with your values. It is so you as a patient can understand the technicalities of your disease, and so your doctor can understand the illness experience. And the trend that we are moving towards is that by learning and narrative skills, by learning and reading classic literature, that you can pick up a classic literary novel and you can read that and you can relate that to your own experience, there is power in that. And who would have thought that that's an avenue by which you could heal yourself? And yet it is. It's deeply and fundamentally important to me that I read literature as long as my disease allows me to do it. So as Whitney and I have talked about what lay ahead for us, we are in agreement that the most difficult time ahead will be when we reach a point when I can no longer read and can no longer write. That that blow to my quality of life will be so severe that that's what Whitney and I are preparing for. <clears throat> that how do we have conversations today that pay those dividends into the future? that Whitney knows about my decisions today for advanced directives, for the treatments that I would like in the future. It's best to have those conversations today. Those are difficult conversations to have. Whitney and I had those conversations in part because we read Paul Kalanithi's book and we read it individually and it developed a shared language that we could then approach those conversations together. So that that beautiful memoir, that beautiful expression of identifying what is most important in a patient's life then turned into the foundation of dialogue for Whitney and I. So what we've been in this evening, we've been in the presence of what I call narrative medicine. And it's by sharing my story, it's by visiting with friends one-on-one, -on -one, it's by taking car rides to, um, you know, treatment and therapy, it's by getting together every three or four weeks with a group of philosophy faculty who challenge me to stay intellectually engaged. That we're not just hanging out and catching up, but that we are sort of actively challenging each other in these sort of intellectual debates, that that is keeping me engaged to preserve my values of quality of life for a longer period of time. So that I hope you take away from this evening that narrative medicine, as Rita Sharon says, leads to a place where you are moved to action. I hope that your hearing my story this evening moves you to action in some way. And how wonderful would it be if that way is to more deeply explore your own quality of life today, whether you're diseased or not, that you uncover your own values such that that may be a benefit to you down the road. Thank you. <laughs>